here today with Professor Ross McKittrick, who's a professor of economics at the University of Guelph, and also one of our grantees for a grant titled State Contingent Environmental Policy. Uh, welcome, Ross. Thank you, Perry. Now, when I first looked at your grant, I asked myself, what's new economic thinking about this? This is really just uh, pigou tax, you know, tax some externality. But when I read it a little more, it seemed like actually there was some new stuff going on here about political economy, about finance, uh, present value of things. Um, have I got that right? Yeah, to an economist, there's an externality, you put a price on it, and, and, and that's that. But what's different about the global warming issue is it, uh, it doesn't fit into the standard environmental economics toolbox because in the, the usual textbook case, the emissions themselves cause damages. And so we look at the, what's called the damage function, which just summarizes the value of what's being done as the externality. And you can base the tax rate on the damage function. But in the case of global warming, it's not the emissions themselves that cause the problem. It's the way they affect an environmental state, namely the state of the climate. And that being the case, we don't have a good pricing rule anymore because we can't just look at the damage function in a, in a straightforward way as a function of emissions. So the typical route for economists is, okay, let's just try to build a great big complex computer model of it. We'll, we'll throw in all these assumptions. These climate models. Uh, they're, they're called integrated assessment models. Uh -huh. so what they do is they take what turns out to be an extremely simplified climate model and an extremely simplified economy model and put them together and just sort of assume that you know all the parameters and then you crank out a solution and, and then you would say, well, this, this gives me a schedule of tax rates that I should then impose for the next hundred years and mm -hmm. present that as a solution. So then you get into some predictable arguments uh, over the values of those parameters. Some of the argument is over discounting, but a lot of the argument really is about how sensitive is the state variable to the emissions. So you'll have, in the case of climate... And the problem is we don't actually know. That's right. We don't know. And um, so you get a very polarized debate going on. You have uh, folks that say uh, the sensitivity is very low, if we start throwing on heavy taxes and charges, that really messes up our development of our energy supplies and it could have serious economic consequences, so we want to avoid that. Then you have folks that would say, no, the sensitivity is quite high, and if we don't act now, if we don't start heavily pricing this externality, we're going to run into a lot of environmental problems. So that's been kind of the stalemate for about 20 years now, and, and the typical way of trying to deal with it has been get people together and negotiate these treaties that nobody follows or mm -hmm. implement local policies that sometimes they get introduced but then uh, they, they fall apart because they're kind of expensive. So it occurred to me one day that we don't really have a model of how the state variable responds to the emissions. But we don't need one because we can observe the state variable itself. And Which is to say the average temperature when you say the state variable. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So assuming we can agree on a measure of what we're interested in, could we set up a model that takes the actual state itself, the, the temperature measure, and then use that to guide changes in the tax rate into the future? And make the tax a function of the, uh, of the temperature. And that's supposed to have a political economic kind of effect. Yes. So. I first proposed this not in an academic paper, but in a newspaper column. What if we set a carbon tax and we tied it to the value of a measure of atmospheric temperatures? And then instantly the intuition starts to work and you realize that everybody's going to expect to get the policy that they prefer. So the folks that think, oh, that's fine because that tax will never go up because the temperature's not going to change. But there are others who would say, well, no, actually, if that was the rule, we'd be in for a decade of sharply increasing tax rates. And so then you think about that being the scenario, you've now committed to this rule that says uh, from here on in this tax is going to go up with the temperature mm -hmm. or not if the temperature doesn't go up. So people have to start thinking about how they're going to respond to it. And it's also going to create a market for accurate forecasts. Well, that's the second thing I was going to say there. You know, this idea that people are now going to bet on the future. Exactly. So, in fact, it's not the economist setting the tax in a certain way. Right. It's the market setting the tax. It, no, it's, it's the market creating the expectations, 
but we're letting the atmosphere set the tax. Mm -hmm. So what the market has to do then is come up with um, a way of producing unbiased forecasts. Of future temperatures? Yes. So this is the question I had about when I read that. I said, is he assuming efficient markets here? I'm assuming efficient markets in the sense that um, you're going to have a schedule of forecasts that you could choose from. Okay, so you, you might have some people that forecast a low tax rate and some that forecast a high tax rate. You as an investor, let's say you're going to build a pulp mill and the difference between those two tax paths could be 500 million in tax liability over the next 20 years. Now you have an incentive to, to get, well you have an incentive to get the best possible forecast, to sift through that information and assess the credibility and, and things like that. So it's efficient in the sense that no one has an incentive to make use of information that they know is biased or they know is wrong. And over time, nobody even has an incentive to publish information that they know is biased. Because if you consistently publish forecasts that turn out to be wrong, as, as the years go by and your forecasts are always too low, then people will say, okay, your model isn't very good. So it would become a, an economic mechanism uh, for solving, not solving the forecasting problem, but at least solving the problem of how do we get unbiased information to work with. So this is, this is, uh, this is new economic thinking. <laughs> I, can, I can hear that now. Well, I, I was noticing in your CV that you publish in economics journals, but also sometimes in physical science journals. Yeah. And so that conversation, tell me about that conversation between economics and, uh, I suppose, climatologists. Yeah. Um, uh, what I found in working in a field like climate is it's such a huge field and there are so many technical issues. For instance, the, the idea of agreeing on a temperature measure. Uh, if you want to understand why that would be difficult, you have to start looking at how these data sets are put together and how they're analyzed and, and actually do some work with them. So you're learning from the physical scientists. Yeah. And, and does it go the other way too? It does yeah. because economists have an empirical toolkit a lot of it was developed for studying the macroeconomy and financial markets. And so you have all these tools for analyzing time series data. Mm -hmm. And we're actually uh, quite a ways ahead in terms of developing empirical methods. Ahead of the physical scientists. Yes. Um, in the field of climatology, when economists look at uh, papers, they're often surprised by how elementary the statistical methods are. And so the papers that I've been involved in publishing is typically because I come in as someone with an econometric skills to a group of people working on a, a temperature issue and, and I can say, well, actually, that's not how you do this. Now, some of that um, is directly related to this project. So I've done a lot of work on evaluating the quality of different temperature data sets. And um, another big project when I got involved in a dispute over something called the hockey stick graph. Mm. And um, that, again, it was strictly because the, the issues came down to some econometric methods. Now, the, so this sounds like a fascinating uh, area that you found yourself into uh, mm. by, just by following your interest. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I noticed in your grant that you have money in there for a graduate student. So are yes. you bringing the young folks along behind you or, or are they working with you or how does that work? Well, um, there's, um, at my university, we, uh, we have a, a PhD program, and one of the areas we um, focus on is natural resources and environmental economics. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, there's a big interest among those students in the, the climate change issue and, and all the policy questions around that. And so, for the purpose of doing a PhD, I, I like to keep the students focused on the economic issues. Um, but lurking in the background, there are so many interesting questions on the physical science side where they've got, already got the toolkit. Once they're trained in econometrics, and I can say, you know, the, look at these giant data sets are actually really interesting to work with. But as part of this project, I do hope to um, focus a fair amount of attention on this question of, of the difficulty of choosing a state variable and uh, evaluating the different ways of measuring, in this case, uh, the average temperature of the atmosphere. We've got surface thermometers and ocean buoys and satellites and weather balloons, and, and which set you pick and where you do the measurements is gonna have an effect on the kind of policy trajectory that you um, would end up with. 
And so people would need to understand uh, why we would have to sift through those measures and how we would go about deciding which one to, to focus on. Well, this sounds great, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're bringing up the new economic thinkers of the future as mm -hmm. well. And uh, we welcome you to our stable of INET economists. Thank um, you. Good to have you. Thanks, Barry.